Hi there. Occasionally I would like to examine some high amplitude signal on the scope but worry that it will overload the inputs. And using ordinary scope ropes like these does not help. As you can see, it's still only 300 volts even when in divide by 10 mode. Let's fix that and build a divide by 1000 probe that can handle at least 10 kV DC. But before we go any further, let's be clear. If you build and use this probe, you do so at your own risk. High voltage can seriously hurt you or damage your equipment. The schematics of my probe is in this red dotted box. It may look a bit confusing initially, but it's really quite straightforward. Essentially what we have is a resistor divider with 5 times 10 meg ohms equaling 50 meg ohms on one side and 50 kilo ohms on the other which is a ratio of 1000 to 1. Strictly speaking, the value of 50 meg ohms is of course slightly too high. To be a true 1 to 1000 divider, it needs to be 50 meg minus 50k or 49.95 meg, but with real world resistor tolerances, that difference can be ignored. The other resistor needs to be 50k, but we must also take into account the input resistance of the device the probe is plugged into. In my case, that will be most often my oscilloscope, which has a fairly typical input resistance of 1 meg. The values of these two resistors are picked so that when the scope and its input resistance is connected, the total resulting resistance of all three in parallel is 50k. Well, 50.36k really, but again this difference can be ignored in the grand scheme of things and taking resistor tolerances into account. What might be confusing is that we also have a whole bunch of capacitors in the schematics. If you look closely, this is really another divider, purely for AC, with 5 times 15 picofarad, equaling a combined 3 picofarad on the horizontal leg and 3 nanofarad on the vertical. This is another 1 to 1000 divider, exactly like it was for the resistors, but because of the capacitive resistance formula, having the capacity value in the denominator, it means at the same frequency, the higher the capacity in farad, the lower the resistance value in ohm. So the 3 picofarad is a very high capacitive rea reactance, while the 3 nanofarad is 1000 times lower. As we did for the resistance case, we need to at least consider that the connected device has its own input capacitance that will be added to the 3 nanofarads, resulting in my case in a theoretical 3.013 nanofarad capacity instead of 3 nanofarads. But the real world capacitor tolerances are way bigger than that, so we can ignore it. You may wonder why I'm putting a capacitive divider in, in parallel with the one made from resistors. Surely the resistors can divide AC as well as DC? That might be the case in circuits containing only resistors, but that's not true here because we need to consider the input capacitance of the scope. Just sticking one or more resistors into the probe would cause a really terrible frequency response. The resistor in the probe and the input capacitance form an RC low pass filter like the one on the left and that has a frequency response like this diagram below with a cut off frequency that is in the low kilohertz range at these component values. You can see one of the large 10 meg ohm resistors I'm going to use in the input for the scope's channel 1 and the generator is connected on the other end with a red alligator clip. If you keep an eye on the RMS value on the lower left on the scope screen and the frequency counter on the upper right while I'm increasing the frequency, you can see the RC low pass with the internal scope capacitance in action. The initial value has dropped more than half and we are just at 32 kHz. Just for fun, I set up the generator to do a sweep from 50 Hz to 30 kHz so you can see the drop in amplitude directly on the screen. Back to our schematics. So the reason for the extra capacitors is to compensate for the low pass to boost the frequency range of the probe beyond frequencies that are so low to be almost still audible. 
Besides the value in ohms or capacitance, there are other important criteria to consider when selecting components for this circuit. Consider the maximum voltage we want to allow at the input I selected 10 kV. At that voltage, the combined resistance of probe and scope will cause a current of about 0.2 mA to flow. That doesn't sound too much, but it means that over each 10 megohm resistors we have almost 2000 volts, and with that current, each needs to convert 0.4 watts into heat. That needs quite beefy resistors. All this will then leave just 10 volts across the output with the same current, those resistors only need to handle a combined 2 milliwatts. So the main concern are these horizontal resistors and capacitors that each need to handle at least 2 kV and in case of the resistors 0.4 watts. It is not easy to find high ohm high operating voltage resistors that can also handle the power, have reasonable accuracy and do not cost tons of money. After quite some search I settled on these V-shaped ones that are rated for 10 kV max and 1 watt. They are available as 1% or 5% but I had to settle for 5% because of the cost. They are quite large, you already have seen one in the low pass test earlier. For the capacitors the search was even harder because suitable types and values are rare. In the end I picked what was available at RC components which happened to be 15 picofarad V-shaped types rated for 3 kV. Originally I looked for 10 picofarad but I could not find anything suitable in stock so I settled for 15 picofarads and even those were so expensive that they are sold individually. With 3 kV per capacitor the probe should handle 15 kV instead of 10 kV but I would not recommend it and I rather treat it as a safety factor. Whatever is available for high voltage capacitors, in my case 15 picofarad, determines what value you need for the other bigger capacitor. The resulting 3 picofarads means I needed a 3 nanofarad value, which is of course difficult to get, but you can easily substitute by 2 times 1.5 nanofarad in parallel, and those are very easy to find and do not need to handle high voltages. All these calculations are kind of theoretical as the only capacitors I could get have a rather large tolerance of plus minus 20%. Here then is everything needed. At the bottom left are the high voltage caps in individual bags. The normal sized 56K and 1 meg resistors are tiny compared to the 10 meg high voltage monsters. By way of example, here is what happens if you run 7 kV through a normal size megohm resistor rated for 200 volts. You don't want this to happen inside your probe, so getting properly rated components from reputable sources is essential for your safety. All components now out of their bags. I already prepared the housing. The low voltage output end has a BNC connector and a simple screw to be able to connect an earth wire. For the high voltage end I choose a simple binding post. Not exactly 10 kV material but this is fine because I do not plan to ever hold this box in my hand while it's connected to high voltage. That would be far too dangerous. For the same reason I decided to use a plastic housing instead of the useful shielding of a metal enclosure. The high voltage string assembled. To fit into the enclosure I had to make the gaps between the resistors really tight. Here you see the finished circuit, ready for testing. On the right you can see the two 1.5 nanofarad caps and the two by comparison tiny resistors that complete the circuit. The high volt resistor string is suspended between the two ends. With careful handling this is fine for doing some testing but for real use this needs to be secured both electrically and mechanically by putting it in. As a first test I want to check the DC accuracy and show that you can use the probe with a multimeter too. I am using my high volt DC source, link in the description. Like many brands, Bryman meters have 10 meg ohm input resistance, not 1 meg, for which the probe is designed. But not to worry. All you need to do is to add a 1 meg ohm resistor across your multimeter inputs.
you can calculate that the correct value should be 960k which you could approximate by 560 390 and 10k in series but I could not be bothered. As you can see with a 1 meg ohm resistor 85 volts translates to 84.2 millivolts an error of just 1% which is acceptable to me. Let's crank the voltage up a bit. At 200 volts we get 189 millivolts, again 1% off. Since the DC test showed that the probe is functioning correctly, it is safe to use mains for a simple AC test. As you can see, 238 volts AC produce 237.5 or so millivolts AC on the other side, correct to within half a percent. This was of course at mains frequency which happens to be not quite 50 Hz today. What about higher frequencies? How does the low pass compensation work out? We need to use the scope for that. The yellow channel is connected directly to my function generator while the blue channel goes through the probe. It is a lot more fuzzy because at one thousandth of the amplitude of the yellow trace it has naturally a lot more noise at these low inputs. I mean while the function generator is set to a maximum amplitude of 20 volts peak to peak that's hardly qualifying as the high voltage input for which this probe is designed. As you can see the blue channel is set to times 1000 so with both channels at 5 volts per division the traces should be identical and at 1 kilohertz they nearly are, well within the tolerances for components used inside the probe. If we switch to the usual rectangle wave similar to what's used for probe compensation we can see a slight deformation on the blue trace. It being a high voltage device I did not want to add a compensation trimmer and try my luck without it. It's actually not that bad. Let's see where the upper bandwidth limit actually is. 10 kHz still seems fine. So do 90 kHz and 100 kHz. 1 MHz is still fine. Three megahertz still looks okay. Four megahertz and there's a slight phase shift. Five megahertz and we see some distortion in addition to the phase shift. And from then on the waveform gets more and more distorted. So it's usable up to three megahertz, which isn't great, but reasonable for this self build. On to some real high voltage tests. On the left you see a small high voltage generator that can produce a couple of kilovolts at very low current. I built this recently and leave a link in the description if you have not seen it. The probe is connected directly to the high volts terminal. The scope is set to times 1000 at 2 kilovolts per division. The wine you hear is the transformer in the high voltage generator. I can adjust the output peak voltage by allowing more DC current into the generator but the switching transistor in the generator gets very hot very quickly. The probe works very well and gives a clear indication of what's going on. Time to make it permanent by putting it in which is as you will see the first time I've ever tried that. As genuine putting compound with the right electrical properties is quite expensive. I build a mold from white ABS plastic cutoffs around the components to reduce the volume needed. The compound is this stuff that comes in a bag containing two epoxy components that need to be mixed. By the way, the two plastic pieces sticking out from the mold on the far side are just temporary spacers. Once the bar separating the two compartments of the epoxy pouch is removed, the two components need to be thoroughly mixed by kneading the stuff for a few minutes. Well, here goes nothing. Let's pull the stuff in.
which after the kneading is now far more liquid than before. It is supposed to gel in 60 minutes and cure completely in 24 hours at room temperature, but if you are in a hurry, you can accelerate the curing to just 20 minutes at 20 degrees Celsius. I calculated that with the 50 grams of potting compound and the mold dimensions, I should have just enough to completely embed all the components and top them with a thin layer. Well, that did not work out as planned. Before it gelled, the thin resin managed to leak out of the gaps of my mold and flood the rest of the enclosure. As a consequence, the level within the mold sank and partially exposed the components. Oh well, that's a lesson learned for the future. As for this probe, it's not too bad. Even with the partially potting, the components are now secure in place and no longer bouncing up and down at any knock. That means topping this up with more epoxy can wait until some other potting job comes along. And that's it for this little project. Thanks for watching.